Hi everyone and welcome to um, day two of the BFI Future Film Festival 2021. My name is Alex and I'm the festival programmer and producer. And to start off, apologies about the audio uh, issues um, at the beginning. We just had some uh, technical difficulties on our end, but I hope you were all able to uh, see that um, sizzle reel, which is some such as um, sizzle reel. Uh, some such have uh, helped us curate um, today's session. Uh, and they are a production company who've recently been named production company of the decade by Campaign Magazine. Um, so in this session, we'll discuss with our team how all those aspiring directors amongst you can work with a production company like some such. Um, just before we get into that discussion, you know, I wanted to let you know that we have our festival team working behind the scenes today. Um, so my colleague Noel, who's already introduced himself in the chat box, he will be managing um, the chat throughout the session. So if you have any questions that are kind of not necessarily for our panelists today, so maybe more generic questions about the festival, about our events coming up, then please um, pop them in the chat box and Noel will be answering them um, throughout. But if you have any questions for our some such team today, for our panelists today, then please pop those in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screens and my um, colleague Winnie will be managing those and you can start asking questions now. We will devote the last 15 minutes of today's session um, to answering your questions and we always get loads of questions from you guys but we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, our session today is moderated by Rowan Woods. Rowan is an independent editorial consultant, uh, programmer and moderator. She works for the British Council where she advises international festivals on UK projects and she's also a programmer at the BFI London Film Festival. She's previously worked um, on many of the BBC's key film programs and was a development executive at BBC Films. But just before I hand over to Rowan, I wanted to let you know that today's session is being recorded and we will upload it to the BFI YouTube channel um, after the festival, so in approximately two to three weeks. The best way to know once this recording is up, if you want to watch it again, is to follow us, BFI Film Academy, on our Twitter channel and we will post um, um, an update once the recording is available um, to watch um, on YouTube again. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Rowan to introduce you to our uh, lovely panelists today. Enjoy the session. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Future Film Festival. Um, as Alex said, um, today's topic is going to be on um, production company representation and how that can benefit directors um, versus working with production company versus working independently. Um, I'm joined by the team at production company Some, Some Such, an award-winning global production company working at the intersection of advertising, film, fashion and music. Um, on today's panel, uh, we have uh, Rose Brownlow, Head of Sales, Some Such. Rose, do join us. Oh, that's not Rose. Hi, Rose. Uh, we also have Dan Emerson, uh, who's a director represented by Some Such. Um, Andre Reed, who's their music video rep. Do join us, Andre. Hi. Um, and Emery Rueg, who's their executive producer. Hi, Emery. Um, so you'll have seen um, the uh, sizzle reel, Some Such a sizzle reel, just at the top of the um, at the top of this session. Um, but Let's get a little bit more of a taste for the kind of work that Some Such do. Rose, perhaps you could just sort of fit us in on, give us a bit more context for Some Such as a company. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so Some Such was founded 11 years ago now by Sally and Tim, who Sally worked for a production company herself. She was a producer and Tim worked for, as a music video commissioner and they happened to be a couple but they recognized an opportunity to create more than just a production company um, and to create a culture that they didn't feel existed at the time. No one was making the work that they wanted to see. Um, so they built the company from the ground up. They had a handful of really exciting new talent. Um, and largely, I think what was a huge success for some such was they weren't afraid to shout about what they believed in. Um, so yeah, because of Tim's background, Sally's background, music was a huge part of, um, yeah, a huge part of what some such at the heart of what they do, hence the sizzle reel. Um, and it still is today, but we primarily focus on 
advertising, film, fashion, and music. Um, but it's all about the film craft and really like sustained by great writing. That's what we look for in every project that we do. Um, so we've had a hugely successful 11 years now. Um, and we recognize that we're lucky enough to be, to have an opportunity to improve the current problems and barriers in the industry and to shape the way that the industry works and to stand up for what's right and to ask questions of our clients and collaborators. So yeah, that's where we are today. Fab. And just before we sort of um, dig a little bit deeper into what each of you actually does there, um, are you working predominantly across sort of short form work or are you also making feature length work? It's a combination of things. Um, so day to day, it's primarily short, short form and advertising, but also like last night, we actually won uh, the Biffa for Anil Karia, um, best short film. So yeah, it's a range of things, but we also have longer length feature stuff in the background as well. That's fantastic, congratulations. Um, okay, so let's get stuck in. Um, so Rose, I mean, as we're talking to you, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what you actually do there, what your job entails, what head of sales means. Yeah, so it's my job to um, represent the directors on the roster and to go out into the wider industry to speak to the agencies, the producers within the agency and the creatives who are writing the scripts um, and to make sure that each and every director on the roster is kind of at the forefront of everyone's minds and that their work that they're making throughout the year is kind of constantly on their radar um, and to like work very closely with the directors and navigate their career path and where exactly they want to be working what kind of brands they want to be working with and to go out and try and kind of foster that for them great we'll definitely come back and talk about that a little bit more later and perhaps how that sort of relates to or differs from from having having an agent um andre perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about what your what your job entails you're the music video rep yeah sure so i'm a music video rep um Essentially, it's just repping directors for music videos. So um, similar to roles, you know, speaking to um, labels, commissioners, um, you know, it, sometimes a director may have a, a fresh brief that I mean, a treatment that they want uh, for a specific artist, I will go out and do my best to try and get the conversation started. Um, and also, uh, you know, it helps to develop the off roster list as well in terms of um, getting them more music uh, video opportunities, which would then, you know, could potentially stem the the relationship between themselves and, and some such. Fab. And we'll definitely dig a little bit more into exactly how the company works with directors shortly. Um, Emery, um, you're an executive producer. Tell us what does that, what does that mean in this context? Hi everyone. Um, it sounds like a fancy title, but it, it really isn't. Um, effectively, my job is to support the directors um, in the process of pitching on whatever commercial or short project or whatever form project that might be. And that can entail as much as developing the creative response to the briefs that we get. Um, working with the producer on budgeting and figuring out the most suitable approach in realizing that um, creative execution and then sort of bridging if you like the gap between the advertising agency or the client depending on what kind of uh, setup it might be so that I will begin the sort of first conversations between the key players on their end to make sure that everything is moving forward in the pitching process and then hopefully if we win the job I will then support the director and the producer throughout the process of that job so that can be anything from just being there to discuss creatively uh, with both parties uh, but also quite frankly to sort out any problems that might come along the way putting out fires dealing with contractual stuff um, maybe being a, 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 an ear to, to, to listen to or speak to in terms of when there are problems because there are often problems on shoots and not least in the current climate where we're dealing with COVID, 
it's a regular part of my week and my day where we're having to think about and make sure that we're doing the right things on that front too. So it's very much an overseeing role. Um, it can be parts creative, it can be parts uh, very much sort of nuts and bolts, um, but effectively you're sort of there as, as, a, as, a, as a bridge between all the key players really. Um, and then when you've got a bit of time off, you, you try and also help nurture some of the more emerging talent as, a, as an executive producer, as well as trying to see, you know, who's new and, what, and what's out there. Um, you know, keep, keeping tabs of what's moving culturally as well is quite important as an EP. Fantastic. Um, and Dan, um, tell us a little bit about how you work with Sunsatch. Yeah, hey everyone. Thanks for joining today. Happy to be here. Um, so I'm a director um, and I'm represented by some such, along with, I think, you know, there's about 20 plus other directors who make up the, the, the sort of global roster. And yeah, so my role as a director is pretty much, well, first and foremost, a creative role. So the way our industry works is that a client, whether that's a, you know, a, a, a record label or, um, you know, some sort of company will give a brief to some such um, for an advert they may want to make. And then I, my job is to kind of visualize that and interpret that um, creatively into, into my vision that we will then, well, which will, they will then hopefully, you know, buy. <laughs> and then we can go off and make that. And then I'd see through the whole creative process from, you know, what the film would actually look like, how it's edited together, you know, the colours we add to it, all that kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's kind of in a nutshell what being a director is. Yeah. But there's a lot of writing treatments and um a lot of the time is just getting to the point of filming a job is is, you know, is is rare, you know. Or it's it's just a numbers game, you know, you win some, you lose some. So that's um that's part of the job as well. And when we say, um, could, could you expand a little bit more on, on what a brief is? And a client will often be sort of sending that brief out to, to multiple different production companies and they're sort of bidding on that. Could you expand on that process a little bit? Yeah, sure. That's basically, you just, that's about it really. So they, a client will come to, to us and they may want to sell a pair of trainers, you know, and they may send a basic idea which would be like a basic outline of their idea of how they want to sell the product. And they'll send that to usually three production companies. And there'll be one director from each production company that will treat, or, you know, give, give that idea their treatment. And that, you know, treatment is basically a document that's really detailed and it explains like all the ins and outs of how, you know, the film will look and feel and all, of, all that kind of thing. So what happens is we, the directors will send the briefs back to um, you know, the client or whoever it is, and then they'll choose their favorite idea. Um, and, then, you know, and then you go off and make the film. Then they release their budget, their money, and then uh, we make the film. And with the help of you know, producers and well, a huge, huge team, it's a massive team effort from start to finish, of course. Um, so, you know, even from the treatment process, we work with, um, you know, people that are writers and then graphic designers, you know, to, to, to sort of help visualise and, and articulate my ideas. Fantastic. We might come back to that a, li a little bit. Um, but let's sort of um, kind of expand a little bit and sort of clarify about exactly how a, um, what that means for a director to be represented by a production company um, like like some such and 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 how exactly a, a, a sort of um a co the company works with directors andre perhaps you could you could pick this up um essentially how how i best like to put it is um production company essentially just a big support system for the directors so that will be from every step of the stage from a job or even if um they have a personal project on for example they would do their best um to facilitate however they can to get in that personal project done. And that could be anything from like a short film to a feature or, you know, just even if it's just like a editorial piece. Um, but 
yeah, essentially, as um, Emery touched on and, and Dan touched on, you know, from the um, pitch and stage, we're he uh, heavily involved in terms of sometimes helping the director uh, have a team together to, to help put his treatment to, to life, um, to, you know, the actual pre-production stage where, you know, if it's for a commercial, it'd be like setting up um, documents for pre, uh, like, you know, um, a PPM meeting or, um, you know, got having a cause with clients or, or the artists or the, the commissioners um, to then uh, having support, uh, sorry, having support on set as well. Um, then, you know, you've got the whole post stage of things where you, you, you've got edit, um, you know, you've got editing, you've got uh, grade, sound. I mean, the, the production companies across the whole process with the director. Um, even when the job is done and if there's like a launch or if we've got a film and we're looking to submit it to festivals, the production company is, is very much involved in, in the whole process uh, uh, with the director. And is it just a case of responding to, to briefs, like, you know, like Dan outlined, a, a company coming to you and saying, oh, we want to advertise these trainers, or are directors also generating their own ideas? You know, perhaps, you know, Neil Carrier's film, for example, that, that, that won the Biffa, isn't in response to a, to, to, to a brief. Well, yeah, um, you know, sometimes the director may just have an idea and just want to get it um, made. You know, they may come to us with the idea and, for example, if it's a music video, they will be like, oh, I really like, um, like this idea. I feel, I feel it would be suited for this specific artist or, you know, artists like, like um, uh, that specific person. And then we will go out and, um, you know, speak to the right people to try and get it done. But then at the same time, um, we always encourage directors to build a relationship with artists, for example. And um, in, in that stage, that's kind of how the uh, Neil Carver and Riz uh, job came about in a sense you know they met through mutual friends and from there they kind of built, built a relationship and was able to collaborate on such a special piece so um it does it, it it does vary but you know regardless um as i said before you know the production company are, are, most of the time are, are there as a support for every step of the way i mean even if it's just the initial stages and it's just a talking stage we kind of try and do as much for the director so they can just solely focus on the creative part of whatever job they're, um, they're in. And so how does this, Rose, perhaps this is one for you, um, how does this differ from, um, from having an agent? Um, it's a very similar sort of role, isn't it? Especially that yeah. kind of nurturing element. Yeah, I think it is really similar. I think similar in a way that um, you've got someone seeking out the right projects for you and managing the relationships with the people that you would want to be working with. Um, but it probably differs in the fact that it's not so exclusively focused on the individual. Um, we kind of foster a really interesting and diverse roster of directors who complement some such as values um, and approach. So you're kind of part of a bigger ecosystem. Um, and it's my job to maintain that identity of the company um, and its directors, yeah, with more of a holistic approach I guess an agent may take um, and while I'm kind of I'm the one out there speaking to the clients and the face of the company as soon as you win a job as a director you're kind of you benefit from every person in that company from the execs to the producers to the director's assistants and um, yeah it's kind of it's such a team effort to get to that final piece of work at the end so yeah. Mm. And Emery, perhaps you can um, help us dig in a little bit more into the sort of the sort of the pra how, how it works in practice. Like are, di are directors under exclusive contract to some such? Are they only allowed to work for you or do they work for other people? And do you take a sort of percentage of the fee or do you pay them a fee? How does that work? It can be a number of those things. Um, that can depend on the status of the director. Um, I think it's fair to say that if, as happens, uh, a director of, of a high standard with a lot of work, award-winning work behind them, if they join a company like some such, there probably would be a contract attached or certainly an agreement in principle. Um, and often that might be based on, on, on territory. So, for instance, we obviously have our London office and we have an office in L.A., and there are some directors who we represent globally and there are some that we only represent 
in America and there's some that we only represent in the UK. Um, there are many partners that we work with, other great production companies, where we share directors across different territories. So they may only look after them in France, we may only look after them here. Uh, it really comes down to the current state of that particular director. I think I would say if for a young emerging director, can't say this 100% for certain, but it, it would be unusual for, for, for there to necessarily be a contract attached at that point. In terms of if, you're, if the question is around, you know, how our directors, whether retainers are paid anymore, I don't really see that as being, um, that was something that was very much of a, of, a, of a bygone era. And I think, again, maybe the older directors or, or, or those who applied their trade in the 90s or noughties, they might expect that sort of, of a deal. But I think directors now, the, and we'll probably touch on this later, the, the industry is so much more fluid and the kind of work we're creating you know, in the workplace itself is much more fluid in terms of the types of jobs that we ex execute. Um, it's no longer uh, uh, beholden on us to have to keep or want to keep a director from, from necessarily being exclusive. Mm. Within, within the realms of advertising and, and what we do, of course, we don't want necessarily want them to be working with anyone and everyone. And that usually comes down to territory. But um, as Andre also pointed out, we very much encourage uh, our directors to come up with their own ideas. And sometimes that means that they go off and do things that doesn't necessarily always involve us, but we may support them in some way or another. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to sort of like um, to say that it, it changes as the sort of like uh, platform of work changes. We have adapted to that. Mm -mm. And and how do you decide? So say you get a brief in from from a brand. I mean, Nike plucking a, a brand out of out of thin air. Um, uh, how do you decide which of your directors you are going to uh, give that work to or allow to sort of uh, pitch for that for that work? Um, I, mean, I feel like Rose might be a good one to answer that question but I mean effectively um, the agencies will already know who they want to approach so they will usually come with a question of is so and so around we've got an idea that we think would be perfect for them obviously the basis of having you know a website with our show rule and our roster up is that people can always go in and check and see the work that we're doing and obviously check individually on our directors and the work that they've done. So agencies will have been doing their homework in the process of writing scripts. So if it was a Nike brief, a sport brief, they would be looking particularly at directors who've got previous uh, um, um, work that might be aligned to sport, around sport, doesn't necessarily have to be football, but certainly has that sort of kinetic energy that might be required. And then they will draw up a long list where eventually they'll draw up a short list and at some point they may well approach us. So that's usually how it happens. Um, I just actually wanted to expound quickly on something that Rose said, which is really important earlier about the culture of some such some production companies have a very strong identity, some such clearly does, and there are others that do too, others less so. I think one of the benefits of having a strong identity or a culture within a production company is that when inevitably a script comes in and for whatever reason a director can't take on that script, A, because they're too busy or it might not be right for them, we're able to off, like switch that to perhaps another director make another suggestion because We've got a culture or, or, or an identity that people will know and in some ways trust. So when we offer up, let's say, maybe not their first choice, uh, we've got a strong chance of being, of being able to sell that script to another director because they know, okay, maybe that's not who we were thinking of, but that person's also got great work. And I think that's something that's very keen and important. I think that's also something that, that Tim and Sally very much fostered. And I assume also that, you know, brands know that they, they associate a certain kind of threshold of quality with, with, with the company and sort of trust your, um, uh, you know, sort of standards and, and kind of identity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, some people put set a lot of store in, in awards and awards are great, don't get me wrong. Um, but um, I, think, I think it's important to recognise, particularly with the audience that might be watching, I, I, I feel personally our most important 
department within our company is the music video and content department. I think it's the sizzle reel that you showed up front is just that. It's none of our commercials, it's the music videos that we've made. And I think part of that philosophy is the importance of how we break, as we like to say, directors. And a lot of that comes through the music video uh, world and the content world. It's the place where you probably are allowed the most amount of expression. And I think any young directors watching or creators watching, um, Dan will know this as well, but creating a relationship with someone, you know, whether it's in fashion or in music and, and starting that relationship early with somebody and going on that journey with them is a real, real great way of creating work, getting seen, getting noticed, and then being able to approach a company like ourselves and say, hey, by the way, I've been working with so-and-so. And we will be aware because we've got, you know, obviously like to think that we've got our ear to the ground in terms of what, what, what's happening and what, what's interesting and what might break. And that, I think, is a key part of that development as a director. And I think that's something that some such has always done is look to identify or look to find people who have already got those relationships going um, because that's how, you, that's how you build work and that's where we break our directors and that's where people go, wow, they're doing really cool stuff. So I think that, that probably hasn't changed in a, in a long time. It probably still is one of the best ways to get in and get noticed. Great. Um, and when, when we're talking about breaking, we're talking about breaking them out rather than breaking them down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan, um, perhaps you can expand a little bit on from your experiences. Um, you know, I think Emery's just given us sort of a really good sense of, of how working with a production company can be really beneficial. But from a, from a director's point of view, what are the benefits to a director of working with a production company? Well, there are many. I mean, like Andre said before, they act as a kind of, you know, all encompassing support kind of system for you. Um, I'll go back a little bit, if you don't mind, because I think like when I was, I, I initially approached some such with an idea for a film that I wanted to make um, that um, was based around an Instagram project that I was doing at the time. And they, you know, I, I sort of came to them with the idea for the film and, you know, had, had a sit down with, with Tim, um, who is one of the co-founders of some such. And he was really into the idea and um, he, he basically kindly sort of gave me a, a little bit of budget to, to make this thing happen on a shoestring. Um, and then I went off and did that kind of just very, you know, pretty much on my own with like a couple of friends basically helping me do that. And we're working in a very kind of loose kind of, you know, run and gun type of way. Um, and we made this thing, put it together and it ended up being really successful online. And, you know, and then when I went back again, <laughs> Tim was, they were a bit happier to see me, you know, and um, they started giving me briefs, music video briefs. And I was thrilled, you know, so I started, you know, pitching on that and got to grips with the pitching process and, you know, found my way in to the industry like that. And then having that immediate support system available when I did start getting more briefs from them and, and seeing, okay, you've got someone that can help you with the, you know, the layout of the document while you concentrate on, you know, articulating your idea on paper and then, you know, through every step of the way, you've got, you know, an EP like Emery who would, who would, who I'd call and say, oh, you know, do you think there's enough money to make this idea happen? Or am I going too crazy with my imagination for this idea? And, you know, and then everyone kind of helps each other out to get to the point where the idea is in the best shape. Um, so, yeah, that's basically working with production companies, you know, it's, it's, it's super beneficial because you get, you get that support and you get you get constructive criticism which at the beginning can often be quite hard to take any criticism on your own ideas but it's always for the best usually um <laughs> so yeah and how how much um how much creative freedom do you get given in response in responding to these briefs are you able to sort of really um, kind of demonstrate your your voice and your vision as a director or is there a danger that you sort of um, end up sort of working 
uh, to someone else's style? Like, how do you how do you balance that as a director? Well, I think we touched on this earlier by saying that you know, I think music videos and their nature allow for the most kind of creative, you know, freedom. So typically they tend to be the loosest briefs, um, which let you kind of, you know, go a bit more crazy with your imagination. But then there's usually budget, you know, money constraints with music videos. and you, you have to kind of meet somewhere in the middle between your idea and what's possible for the money that you've got allocated. But then when you start getting up to, you know, bigger content jobs and commercials, your, you know, your creative freedom kind of, it tends to not be diminished, but I think the, the, the agency or the client will already have quite a clear idea of how they want their, you know, film to be like, their advert to be like, their commercial to be like. So you're just kind of bringing it to life in your own way, you know, with your, with your style. So by that point, you're not necessarily like coming up with an idea from scratch, you know? You're just kind of reinventing and, you know, jazzing up their, their idea. Mm. So, yeah. And Andre, perhaps you can talk a little bit more uh, sort of specifically on the music video side of things. Um, you know, Dan talked a little bit about how it can be so, so beneficial to learn how to, as a director, learn how to pitch, learn how to respond to, to briefs. But in what other ways can it can sort of working on music videos um, really sort of help a director develop? Um, so there's quite a few, to be honest. Um, I would but say confidence is important, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, I was, yeah, confidence. You know, learning, just le uh, learning and understanding the process. You know, developing yourself as uh, as a director as well in terms of whether it's craft or one thing Tim likes to say is um, you know finding your voice in uh, in the sense of like you know having a, a voice as a director, whether it's um, you know, emotive, or if you like your to, uh, to do, you know, work with a message, or whatever it may be. It's just kind of, you know, understanding your 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 sense of style, or, or sometimes even being a bit experimental, um, because like compared to like, you know, content pieces or, or or commercials, as Dan said, the briefs do tend to be quite not all the time, but do tend to be quite broad. So, you know, you kind of have that a bit more creative freedom to 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 kind of play around with. Um, yeah, you know, and even just un learning and understanding that the etiquette and being used to dealing with a client, for example, because it's a lot different than, you know, doing a video for a, for a friend, for example, like even in the post stage, like a lot of directors can probably say, you know, it's a very enjoyable part of the process, but, you know, there's a reason why you have director's cut, for example, that like you, you are dealing with a lot of back and forth and, you know, you may get asked to take out a specific part of the video, which might have been your favorite part, you know, and kind of learning to, to, to let things go and, and stuff like that. You do learn a lot whilst doing, um, uh, uh, doing music videos. And I, I don't know if it's right to say this, but you know, there's a bit more room for error in a sense, you know, you can kind of hide things a lot of the times in, 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 in the post where you might not necessarily get away with that in a, in a commercial. So um, yeah, I, f I feel like in terms of finding your feet as a director, it's definitely a, a very solid place to start. So ideally, you'd say a director would maybe start doing, if, who was on your roster, maybe if you're thinking about career development, maybe start doing music videos and then sort of work up to the sort of slightly higher budget yeah, commercials. Exactly. A majority of the time we do try to, um, like, for example, if we are working with a new director, more, like, more likely we would try and get a music video in for them first and kind of see how things go. And, and again, you get to, to learn a lot about the director as well as the director learning a, a lot about the production company and the people within the production company and the kind of like, you know, um, just the, the, the feel and the vibe of everything really. And again, it's kind of a, a way where we can kind of hold your hand throughout the process and talk you through certain things. And, you know, if you don't understand certain parts of the process or, you know, why you have to do this or why you have to do that, you know, you have that support system to be able to explain things and, and you know, take things slow in a sense. Great. And Rose, perhaps you can expand a little bit more on um, uh, uh, sort of the, the relationship with directors and thinking about it from a sort of supportive, um, like sort of career development or kind of mentorship uh, position. How much is it, is it about sort of helping them kind of navigate, you know, and, and sort of build themselves as a director and perhaps also sort of getting them in front of the right industry people? 
Yeah, um, it's hugely important and it's something we're constantly thinking about and reconsidering. It's, it's not like one at the beginning of the year, we'll kind of do a bit of strategy and, and chat to the director and put them on a path for the year. With every piece of work or conversation that a director has, their kind of place in the market shifts slightly. And it's important for us to kind of constantly be considering where that director sits and who, what agencies they're best suited for. And they've just done a new piece of work with a bit more performance on it than they may have had before. So that means that they should be competing against slightly different other directors in the market. And so, yeah, it's a constant kind of conversation with the directors. And I think it's really important that the directors have that kind of constant mentorship because you want to feel confident that your production company understands you and understands your goals and what you're looking to achieve and um, that you're being spoken about in the right way and that you're being communicated in the right way. So yeah, it's, it's really important for us. And I suppose you'll be speaking to all your regular clients um, and you'll be saying, oh, we've brought on this new director. You know, you haven't sort of seen their work yet, but I think, you you know, knowing the kind of style you like, I think you'd really like it. So you're sort of advocating for the directors in that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, every time we sign a new director, that's an opportunity to promote them and get them out in the market. And we we have a really good kind of communications and PR team as well that help with that but my role allows me to have a bit more individual focus and kind of personal conversations with people brilliant and emery um is working with a director with a company like some such sort of a stepping stone for a director at the start of their career before they graduate to something else to features or do you still maintain a relationship with a director as their as their career career grows I um, like to think that you can maintain the relationship as their career grows. Um, no, I think for, for some, it's like, it's quite clear that they might have a, you know, they might have a trajectory in mind already. And then again, I'm sure some, some people watching this today might already know where they want to end up, i.e. I want to get into doing massive feature films or long form television. Um, I think when you bring up someone like a Neil, career who's, who's one of our directors it's interesting because he's already doing long form stuff he's already done tv stuff and we have a few directors on our roster who actually we signed off the back of in some cases the tv work they've done so it doesn't always follow that they necessarily have to come through the short form uh, access point um i think when someone is good and you can see that they have a craft a genuine passion or craft that can translate across all forms of media, then it, it, you know it can work either end of either end of the scale. Um, I think for emerging directors, obviously they're not going to be given the chance to do long form, so definitely it's a stepping stone for them to develop um, through you know uh, a company like ourselves and get the opportunities to apply their trade and learn and make mistakes. And I think that what, what Andre said is quite important is like. You know, music videos, the pressure's not so high, to be honest, at the beginning. You, you can make your mistakes and, 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 and get the opportunity to grow from them. Still make mistakes when you're making commercials, to be honest, but it's, it's a higher stakes game. And, and at that point, that's why there's more money involved, there's more rigor involved, and, and, you know, in some ways, maybe there's more risk averseness in terms of from clients and people themselves, because, you know, they tend to want to bank on something that they know we know what we're going to get for. I think that's another fundamental point of what Rose's job is as well, is like convincing the agency to take a punt on someone that might not have um, that thing on their show or that absolutely proves that they can do it. But, you know, with her work and then, you know, my work speaking to the agency and saying, look, this person can do it and you present that person in the right way. I think that's the sort of opportunity that would be hard to get if you weren't in a production company. Mm. You're betting on the sort of risk taking, right? Because knowing that if you're with someone like some such with us, people will go, okay, you know what? We trust their body of work. So if they're telling us to 
to, to, to bet on red and red happens to be this director, then that's something that your best place to do within a company. And also just to get to go back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, someone's career trajectory, I think, is it fair to say that the industry has changed so much? There's so much fluidity between different forms and mediums now. It's, it's not so much that you sort of graduate from doing one thing to the next thing. You can work across so many different forms at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, te you know, te technology has shifted that. Um, digital marketing, even though that's like, over 20 years old now but you know since the advent of youtube and facebook which fundamentally changed the way that advertising worked um which then also coincided with you know the ability for people to be, be their own creators and i think that's also really important here is like most young people today are, are pretty savvy at, at creating their own stuff and the technology is out there for for you to be a content creator with really not much else in your mobile phone. That was not the reality when I was coming through as a runner. You know, it cost a lot of money to create anything and there wasn't any platforms for you to put it up. There was really only TV and that was it. So um, obviously everyone has adapted to that, but there definitely was a point where people were still trying to find their feet in terms of how you dealt with the new spaces in which people are creating. So, I think it's good that technology has democratized the way that people are able to approach um, and make stuff. I, I, I think our industry has for too long been a bit of an elite space, but the good thing about technology is it, it opens that up a little bit. And I think if you've got the will and the way, you can get seen and you can create stuff and you can, you know, you can be good without, without letting that elitism, you know, necessarily hold you back. And I assume um, it's also then the case that you d perhaps don't have to worry too much if you're a director about sort of boxing yourself into a particular specialism or being seen as, oh, this guy is a music video director or this guy is a uh, commercials director. Dan, is that something that you, that you think about or sort of worry about when you're thinking about your career? Yeah, I mean, uh... Just to kind of go slightly back to what Emery was saying about how technology makes creating work more accessible for everyone and how I mean, my early projects, and I still do use a lot of found footage, you know, mobile phone footage, just, you know, off the cuff moments that I've managed to capture, which you, you can't really recreate with like, you know, big cameras and lots of crew. So I made a lot of my early work in that kind of way by using lots of different mediums which don't really cost much to make. But then, you know, off the back of those jobs, sometimes you get a chance to experiment with, with more, you know, fancy lighting setups. And then, you know, as, as you progress, uh, you know, you sort of craft your style and all of that sort of thing. But I don't know. I think for me personally, going back to your point about being categorised as a director. Um, yeah, so a lot of people, you know, may start off making music videos and really kind of have a quite a defined style, which they keep kind of coming back to and people want to recreate with different artists and different brands. So through no fault of their own, you, you know, you may, you know, you may get asked to keep doing similar work to work you've already done. But I think it's just about, always trying to push your envelope, like trying to expand, you know, the type of work that you're doing. I mean, I certainly try to as much as possible. I like to take on as many different kinds of briefs as I can um, to give myself the kind of, you know, maximum sort of potential for clients to look at me, I guess, you know, so, but I don't know. I think your voice kind of always does shine through even without, without trying because you just a lot of people have asked me before like oh you know how do I go about kind of crafting my style and I just say well I think everyone's already got it you've already got your your you've already got your own style your own attitude it's just that comes with having a body of work like you start to notice things and similarities between the way you might approach like humor or emotion or framing or whatever that might be um, so yeah, I mean, I suppose you can get categorised and pigeonholed somewhat in your career, but 
you know, you, you can also do all sorts of things. You know, I do commercials, but then I do, I, I've just finished making, you know, a little self-funded documentary, um, which is more of a passion project. But yeah, so, so a lot of work might look very different, but I think it's always your, your, your voice and your style is always in there somewhere, you know. And I suppose it's the job of a good commissioner or a good agent or a good development executive to be able to see past, you know, just the, the sort of the outer form of the work you've already done and go, okay, that person's got a voice. And I think that could translate really nicely to, to this. So you also have to slightly trust in the, in the, in that process. Can I just add on to what you've just said there, Warren, in, in, in the sense of saying um, that is, I feel that that is completely the case just because, you know, there's times where I've put a director forward for a uh, music video brief based off of just one job. And it's just because that one job was so, um, it, it was executed so well. And, um, you know, you kind of get a sense of the, the, the director's character just from that one, piece, um, that one piece of work that, you know, instantly they can watch it and think, okay, cool, we're prepared to give that director the opportunity to, to, to engage on this, on this brief just because of how strong that piece of work is. So, um, yeah, that, and definitely, I would definitely agree with um, you know Dan's last point in that sense. Great, and so I imagine uh, Andre, a lot of your job is then all, is to be quite imaginative and go, okay, well this person hasn't done something because you never want someone to make exactly the same work over and over again. Yeah, exactly. So th this style can be can lend itself to this to this kind of brief. Yeah, I'll say that is that is a um, you know a, a part of the the job in the case in terms of when, when you do get a brief in because for example, like a lot of briefs will come in for a director that's extremely busy, for example. So even if they did like the job, they may not have the capacity to take on the job. And then that's where it'd be like, okay, cool. You know, that director is not available. However, you know, we have a list full of directors that may be suited for that job. And sometimes I would then throw, you know, one or two off roster um, uh, directors in the mix, especially if I feel like they would definitely be able to benefit from an opportunity like this. And so some of the times, you know, they, they may not have, the most polished rule in comparison to a lot of the directors that like we've got a young guy called um I'm gonna do a shameless plug here, you know, Pedro. Um he, he he worked with us for a while and um you know like we when he done the the same job, he executed it down to the T to the point where I've been able to put him forward for other um jobs and he's been considered just due to the fact of, you know, his his that you, his sense of craftsmanship in his work and you know, the way he kind of, kind of carries out his his um this whole process, it's just so on point that I can literally just show one piece of his work and that would be strong enough to give him, get him more opportunities. So yeah, definitely. Brilliant. And Dan already talked a little bit about the fact about, you know, um, his experience as a director approaching a production company. Um, but Emery, perhaps you could talk a little bit about um, how as a production company you go about finding new talent, because of course that sort of journey works, works both, both ways. What are you, what, you know, are you actively looking for new directors and, and what are you looking for in those directors? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you do. I mean, it's funny, I, I, I often think like, it, 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 it's sort of like a, a bit of an organic process in, in the sense that as a company, we get approached, so people will email us. And I think it can often happen that um, you just seem to catch somebody at the right time, like someone else within the company might have heard that person, seen their work, and you would have shared it around and gone, oh, so-and-so has emailed me, what do we think? Um, and it can be as simple as, oh, yeah, I've heard or seen that piece of work that he's done. Yeah, that person would be great to work with. Other times it could be that, you know, we have within our DA group, you know, uh, young DAs who perhaps have their fingers on the pulse in terms of culturally what's happening within a Could certain... I just check what you, what you mean by DA? Sorry, director's assistants. So they will often also share work or, or, or be making us aware of people that perhaps we might be, uh, should be keeping a closer attention to. I think it also follows that we're always watching work. So we will be watching music videos, we'll be watching places in which people are unsigned and posting stuff. And I guess with social media, the, the platforms are so wide and varied, it doesn't take long to go into a deep dive to go, wow, have you seen this? Um, sometimes you might directly go to people, but I think it's, so, it's such a mixture because we do get a lot of obviously inquiries. You know, a lot of people do email us and call us and just approach us. 
and, and sometimes you have to sift through stuff and, and, and identify what's good. I would, I would usually say like, when someone really stands out, it's really, it's, it's really quite clear, you know, it, it's almost like a consensus is reached among everyone who's a, who's a sort of decision maker within the company, like, yeah, this is someone we absolutely need to follow up on. Um, and, and that, that's down to a, a taste, you know, taste making and, and, or rather having a consensus of what kind of taste that we have or what kind of style that we lean into. Um, so there's a number of avenues, but I think it, it, it's a mixture of people approaching us, us falling onto stuff completely by accident, obviously being parts of events like this where you see stuff and you go, that person's not, on, not signed. Why are they not signed? We need to get them. You know, and then you want to be the first in the race. This can, there can often be a clamor to get somebody and then you find out that there's other people speaking to them, which does happen and you'll know who they're speaking to and then you've got to put on, as it were, your best face to convince them that this is the place they need to be. So that, you know, it's surprising, it can be that. And, and, you know, directors can be cheeky. They'll know they'll be playing you off against someone else. So, you know, it's about how much you want them as well. Um, I was just about to say, you can, be, you can be rude about how cheeky directors are while Dan's not with us, but he's rejoined <laughs> us. <laughs> um, and do, do, do directors need to have a certain level of um, experience when, when approaching you? Or is it just about however much experience they've got, as long as they've got something about them, actually you'll, you, you'll consider them? Emery, that's for you. Okay. Um, no, I don't think they do. Um, I think I think we'll know by looking at the work whether they're right. I think usually what would happen is if if we're if we're not one hundred percent certain that they would jump straight onto the roster, we would develop them off roster, which is something that Andre particularly looks looks after, and that's whereby if we get jobs that maybe our on, on roster directors might not take up or take on because a they're too busy or it's not right for them will give them an opportunity to take on that work and see how they develop. So they have an association with us. Uh, and actually that list can be quite long. There's a lot of people who are off roster that come and move and shift and try stuff with us and maybe go elsewhere and then come back. Because there's no exclusivity in, in, in that field, it, it's very much up to the directors themselves to keep developing and keep coming back to us and going, by the way, I've done this whilst you've been busy. Um, I think like what everyone's been saying and what's really clear is like, you can only develop your voice by doing. You need to have an angle on something. And I think that's really important. It's like, however you've grown up, whatever your background is, whatever your experiences are in life, I think that's really important to feed that into your point of view. Trying to find what you're trying to say, in my opinion, should be informed by your lived in experiences. And particularly now more than ever, um, where not identity politics as such, but we're repositioning how we understand, how we culturally relate to each other and what is culturally important and what isn't and what the cultural dominant uh, point of view has been for too long. I think it's a great opportunity for people to talk about their own stories because really in some ways that's the thing that shines through. I think if there's an honesty to your story, whatever that might be, uh, and your um, I hate to use the word authenticity because it does get banded about a lot, but there isn't another word that best enshrines it. It's really about that. It's like, don't try and be someone else. Yes, be, be inspired by other people's ideas. Absolutely. Steal other people's ideas to make them your own. That happens anyway. Let's not, let's not be around the bush, but, but, but don't be afraid to tell your story. And I think if, that, if, you, that, if you're presenting that side of yourself, it's more than likely that, we would take notice as well as everyone else. And I mean, as you say, there are a lot of uh, conversations in the industry about, about sort of authenticity of voice and sort of who gets to tell which story. And also a lot of conversations, particularly at the moment, around sort of accessibility and diversity in the industry. How much as a company do you feel that you have a responsibility to sort of help change the face of the industry you know Andre perhaps this is one for you when you're thinking about new talent and when you're thinking about sort of developing voices off roster and perhaps you can expand on exactly what that means a little bit is, is that something that you guys are really thinking about as a, as a company is something that you have a responsibility for 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like it's getting to the point where almost everyone, um, uh, you know, needs to somewhat take responsibility to to some extent. But um, yeah, no, de- definitely. Like I, me personally, I love um, seeing new talent come through. Like even even just, I, I will say I love it. But you know, at times you may not have the time to go through everyone and stuff like that. But especially when I've you know I'll browse around or go through my inboxes or, or my emails and I'll see that piece of work come just like as Emery said it's like oh my days how come you're not signed who you know how come no one's like 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 picked up your work or anything like that I kind of love it because you know you're you're kind of getting an insight to the future of the industry and that's where I, I feel like as um, Emery said you know develop your voice from now because you know in a few in a few years later you might be the next hot thing you might be uh, you know the newest signing to a, a production company and and you'll have that platform to be able to express yourself um how, however you wish to to, to do so so um yeah now nah, I, I yeah it is something that we we definitely take pride in and um is highly important to us and for myself in particular um yeah definitely i can, I, I love to see i love to see new new, new, new people's work i mean there's a few directors that I've personally worked with where, you know, two, three years ago, they were just either like a duo or just, you know, a young, a young person and not necessarily a young person. I mean, I, I still call, you know, if you're early thirties, you're still a young director. So that, that's also that, no shame in your game in that sense. So um, that, but I love seeing that, that, you know, that development and I always tell people send, you know, keep sending work even if I haven't responded to your email for example your message keep sending work because I've, I think there's beauty in the development you know where if you if if you kind of saw someone's work a year ago and you're like oh yeah not that, that, that's all right and then you know six months down the line or a year down the line you that person's been persistent for that and you're, you're seeing like a another piece of work that's caught your eye it's like oh wow like okay actually you know what let me Kick in with you right now, see what your situation is like, you know, what is there anything like we can do to help? Is there any kind of jobs that might be suitable for you and stuff like that and kind of get the ball rolling? So, yeah, uh, yeah, I love it. Great. And before we open out to questions from the audience, because we've got loads, um, uh, I, let's just sort of take a slightly sort of bigger, bigger picture. You know, we were talking earlier, um, Emery about the um the sort of the shifts in the industry and the industry has changed so much over the past 10 years or so um how are you as a company sort of evolving with those changes and sort of are you I assume you know as sort of audiences kind of needs and um uh the, the way they access content changes you're also sort of make shifting in line with that as a company yeah you you, you have to I think I would say the biggest shift in all content is from it becoming something that was sort of like for the masses to something that is now focused very much on the personal, the sort of intersection of marketing, analytics, social media um, has meant that particularly in advertising, the focus is on how you make advertising more personal to the user. Um, You know, I don't know who said that we are the products, but that is very much the age that we're living in. You know, whether you agree with it or not, you know, the, in terms of the political sociological aspects of, of advertising and how it's aimed at us and how it works on us, you know, that's, you could have a separate discussion on the ethics of that alone, but what it has meant in terms of the te- technological aspects is, is that um, the way in which um, uh, uh, clients, production companies, or, or, or rather the way in which content is actually created has changed. And therefore the relationships that, you know, were well established in, you know, pretty much throughout the 80s, 90s and, and early noughties in terms of how content was created and, and the process that, we, that that took and the structure that that was is very much a changing structure. So that's dependent a lot in terms of where content lives and in how it relates to the users, particularly through mobile phones and, and, and social platforms, as I talked about. So in terms of how we would have, we are changing or need to change in the future, I guess, remains to be seen. But, you know, the advent of augmented reality, virtual reality, all these new spaces that are coming, it's, it's tentatively being explored. So I couldn't really sit here and say, you know, this is something that we already know how it's going to be. But what I would say is, is that 
it's becoming more and more a facet of us um, being able to, or being ready to respond to that and recognize that the normal structures under which we have been working for so long, it's no longer the only way you can skin this cat. The different kinds of relationships, different kinds of creative bodies um, in which your work has to be a little bit more organic um, and, and maybe even think outside the box or think back to front about how you're creating stuff. Um, I think the greatest strength any production company can have, in fact, any creative agency is flexibility. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be flexible and willing to, to go, do you know what? We've been used to doing this way for so long. We've now got to look at it in a different way in order to stay ahead or at least stay in line with the trends. Um, that's not always easy because you can't always identify them. You know, sometimes they hit you in the face and sometimes you're like, wow, we've missed that. How can we catch up with that? So there is a bit of a skill in that, but there's also a bit of luck involved, as it were. You know, someone coming to you with something that you might not have thought about, and, then, and it's about you being open and going, do you know what, we'll give this a go, rather than, well, we're not sure. There's always an element of risk, and I think you, you've got to be able to take risks and be flexible in order to, to change with, with, with the industry. Fantastic. Um, okay, so we're going to dive into the Q&A box and I'm going to try, I'm going to throw as many of these at you guys as I can. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, so what's the best way um, to move from making a sort of DIY or sort of work for free to paid work? Who wants to take that? Oh, Dan. Yeah, yeah, I can take that. Um, well, I think it's just making the work, you know, physically going out there and doing it, whether that's using your phone, you know, old cheap DV cameras or SLR cameras that you and your friends might have, and just making stuff and making those mistakes and seeing what works for you and what doesn't. Um, and then, you know, getting a portfolio, you know, getting, getting a reel of work that, that, that you might be able to then show to, to production companies like some such that you know you, that you can then go to them with something that you've already made to get them excited about you um which then in turn could you know lead to to them giving you other opportunities um but yeah i think diy the diy approach to filmmaking is definitely for me something that i carry into my work now you know um i like to work with 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 mixed formats a lot and 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 i still sneak in the odd shot from my mobile phone into into the odd, like you know bigger commercial even sometimes if, it, if it's the right tone for, for that you know for that particular film um so yeah i think i think you can you can you only need to look at ads now and see that a lot of ads are taking that approach and a lot of bigger films have you know sequences that were filmed on you know mobile phones and that kind of thing um just because it's right for that particular scene or that particular emotion you know that you can get really intimate moments because at the end of the day your phone is so small and like physically you can you can shoot anywhere anywhere so it's just amazing what what you can do now nowadays at your fingertips with just like a mobile phone and yeah, and editing software is pretty readily available now. and You can even edit on your phone as well. So, you know, there's no excuses not to be making stuff, really. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think production companies realise at the beginning that your work isn't going to be super glossy. You know, how is it going to be? Because if you don't have the money to make big features, then you're not, they're not going to look like that. But I think the integrity of your work and the honesty of your voice is what's important and that's what's going to get you noticed really um yeah it's it's what it's all about finding good subject matters whether you're making documentaries about little scenes that interest you and i know for me i'd always reach out to people like on instagram and stuff and and that's how how the ideas for a lot of my films stem from you know i'll reach out to say you know, I made a film a few years ago about a, a bike gang in Wales who I met through Instagram and I was chatting to these guys and I arranged to just go and meet them over a weekend. And we just shot um, shot a film with them. And yeah, and then uh, that's it. And you just kind of make things happen earlier on, don't you? You try and 
try and do what you can to 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 make to make good work and then hopefully it gets it gets appreciated and noticed but like Henry said I think the most important thing is 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 taking from your own experiences and, and your own taste and your own style and what you like outside of filmmaking and what interests you just focus on those things and like wherever there's a passion behind something you know you're gonna if you're passionate about something you're gonna want to do it justice so you know I, I encourage people to like definitely like find little scenes or artists and things that they're interested in and just make stuff you know i also want to add to, to your point Dan, as well just to say it's i find um doing it independently as well just so much more fun especially if you do have a passion behind it um like and there's no like restraints no one kind of telling you oh you need to fit within this kind of brief or anything like that you you've got the kind of freedom to express yourself however you see fit i mean i remember when i um first started some such actually i was like doing videography work um at a studio um, and to be honest it was just by choice i would go after after work and i would just film at the studio and like I remember I just done it. I created like a small series of just a specific um, studio session, and like um, Timberland must have found it on Instagram, and he must have liked like all sixteen videos. At that point, I thought I made it. I was like, oh my days, Timberland's liking my stuff on Instagram. Like, what? I'm waiting for that follow next kind of thing. But it kind of let me know, like, you know, you can kind of do whatever you 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 kind of wish to in a sense, and 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 you know, just kind of seeing how it's received can sometimes be a greater joy in that sense as well so like whilst you can just have fun and and do exactly like whatever it is you wish to do in that sense i would, I would, I would definitely add to that like when i when i first started the, the thing that got me going was was literally going out with my mates on the weekend we used to take our old super eight cam and we'd come up with ideas on the friday night go shoot it saturday sunday and then cut it together and that was really what what started our our like all our separate journeys into this industry. I would have been about 19 at the time. And that's all we did most weekends. We'd meet up at the beer fire, funny enough, at South Bank. We felt we had to be around it just to get inspired. We're like, yeah, well, if we go and sit there and be around all film and stuff, and we'd sit and we'd write some ideas and we'd go out and shoot them. But um, I think going back to an earlier point I made is like, find the things that you're interested in. So whether it's music, whether it's fashion, whether it's documentary, whether it's real people, and don't be afraid to just reach out, develop a relationship with someone who's made it a similar level to you that you like, you know, a musician that you like and say, listen, I really want to shoot your photographs for your album or, you know, come on tour with you and shoot stuff backstage. Honestly, the amount of directors in our industry who, who've come through just from developing and forming those relationships early and, Obviously, there's a bit of luck involved in terms of if the artists break, in terms of become big or not. But even if they don't, it allows you to then find out what part of that process you're interested in. So I think that that's really an important part is being proactive. Um, and also, it's worth pointing out, like, even once you're signed, that's not, it's not job done. It's like, if anything, you then have to work harder because competition is fierce. You know, competition is fierce out there. And it's like, I think the people who, who thrive are those who keep themselves busy because you're not always going to be busy. That's the other side of it that, you know, people have to realise is like, there will be quiet times and how you feel that quiet time, best way to do that is to try and be proactive and have stuff bubbling. Because if you don't and you're just waiting for stuff to fall in your lap, I don't think that that's the right attitude. And is there a, um, it's another question, is there a directory of production companies that directors can access? Uh, where, where are the best places to find work, apart from some such, obviously? Um, that's a really good question. I'd probably say a good place to start, um, possibly, is the APA website. They've got Advertising Producers Association, a whole list of all of the production companies who have signed up to them. Um, do you guys know anywhere else where you can find that list? And then what was the second question? Um, no, that was, it was just, what are the best, what are the best places to find work? Um, if, if, if different. 
sometimes I would even suggest, um, I hate to say it as well, but you know, if you know someone, um, you know, like for example, uh, like yeah, if you know anyone with a, within a, like an agency or production company, I mean, sometimes just word of mouth um, is sometimes always the, the, the best thing. Like I tell a lot of the interns that, um, well, when the, the, the office is open, I always tell them like, you know, treat, treat kind of every opportunity as if, you know, you're trying to get a job there kind of thing. So when you're on set, even if you're, you're on set as a runner, like do your best to kind of, you know, impress the DA or the producer or the, the production team in a sense and, you know, kind of, yeah, treat it as if you're trying to get a, a job from it just because so many interns have kind of been able to get their foot through the door in the industry just through interning in terms of like they might have been on set with us really um, hit it off with the DA or the producer and now that freelancer is kind of um, hiring them almost every time they're they're on a on a on a job so um, I'm, yeah I hate to say you know it's, it's, it's who you know in a sense but I mean and just reach out reach out so, like I, I like to use um, even for my job as a rep I, I like to use LinkedIn if I'm trying to find someone or, 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 or something um, I'm literally on LinkedIn all the time kind of uh, reaching out to people as well so you know I, I'll definitely say you know use the social media platforms um, try and find uh, groups whether it's on like Facebook or or Instagram that are always putting up like job alerts as well for even because I know like uh, I've been on set I speak to runners and some of them are telling me like they've like they've shot like a small little commercial for finish or for Ribena and I'm like how did, how, how did you even come across that? And they're like, oh, yeah, just, you know, on a Facebook group, someone posted up the opportunity, I pitched for it, and I won it kind of thing. And then, you know, I'm just like, well, I need to find those Facebook groups. That was like a few years ago. I'm sure they're still about now kind of thing. But, you know, I'd, I'd definitely say in this day and age, technology is our, our, our best friend. Yeah, and I think the traditional model of the agency and the client and the production company has shifted so much. And it's way more flexible now. Clients are coming direct to production companies um, because they've got smaller budgets and they want to put more money on screen. Uh, but that opens up opportunities for individuals who are kind of trying to make it to, like Andre said, LinkedIn's amazing. You can be really creative with who you get in touch with, like small new brands that don't have much money that want to make a piece of content. They might have like a marketing person on there that you can contact directly and share your stuff. So yeah, be creative and proactive. Also creative directors as well. A lot of creative directors get a lot of jobs in sometimes. And you know, if they know a few directors they reach out to, sometimes the jobs may be a bit too small for some of their directors that they may know. So, you know, that's always an opportunity there to kind of reach out to creative directors, show them your work, because they may consider you if they get a small brief that, you know, one of their main directors might not be able to kind of facilitate that could be an opportunity as well. And I assume all of that absolutely applies to people um, who aren't based in London. We've got a question here for people who, 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 who aren't in London and I suppose with, with technology and sort of social networking. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, most, most, are, so yeah, it depends where they are. I mean, most, most countries might have their, you know, will have production companies that they can approach locally. Uh, as well, obviously, if 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 it's particular that they want to work in the UK market because of there's something about the aesthetic or the kind of directors that they really like and enjoy, then really the best way would be to to come to to, to the UK and explore that because it's it's hard to develop that from far away. You know, you want to be here in the mix if that is your thing, but by all means, it doesn't have to be here. There's you know, Berlin, Paris, Stockholm. You know, there's amazing cities where amazing content is constantly being made. So there's lots of places you can go you know, to, to, to develop that, that side of yourself. It's just about if your particular thing is, do you know what, I'm loving what's coming out in London, then that's where you, that's where you have to be, you know, in some, in some, in some cases. And just, just, to, just for all the people out there who are like, you know, I see it on the message there, are oh, people from all over um, the UK on this, it's great. I was born in the northeast in Newcastle, and I, you know, I. It often feels like I guess everything's so London centric these days, and th that you have to be in London to to be part of this kind of bubble. I mean, to, I mean, I think now, especially with COVID times, where everyone's not at the same premieres and not at the same parties and screenings, use this time to to focus on what's on your doorstep. 
like what is what's amazing about where you are because there's definitely going to be something happening that is that you can you know that you can that you can focus on and again it goes back to just being honest about who you are and, and where you're from and and just finding that voice of finding something that's interesting where you are and making something of it yeah and um, yeah so is it but yeah like you know i definitely think that it, it can feel like london is the epicenter of everything that's happening but i just think you know there is still scope to to to, to approach people online to to be part of the, the the industry the community um you know and and not be in london basically and just to quickly add on that sorry lastly as well um uh also could for, for example i'm from birmingham and when i was growing up i definitely didn't know it be any kind of creative outlets to kind of um reach out to or go to and stuff like that but that for example one app called clubhouse has connected me from so that to so many people from the midlands now that um that that create uh content which i would never have kind of come across beforehand kind of thing so and to, which I ever find out there's like, you know, local production companies within that area as well and stuff like that. So I definitely say reach out to them because especially the smaller companies at this stage, they would almost love to get like young, um, uh, talented directors that they can somewhat call out to, you know, because more likely or not, they, they may have, you know, a, a few jobs on which they may not be able to execute all of them because of like, you know, just the small resources that they may have. So I definitely say, you know, try and find a, find and reach out to like local um, companies, whether it's up north, Midlands, even down south as well. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, so off the back of what, of what you were just talking about, Andre, um, if you're a director and you're approaching a company and you're seeking representation, what's the most important thing that you, that you guys would take into account? Is it the view, how many views their work has had? Is it the kind of accolades, you know, festivals that their work has been in? Or is it how many credits they've had? Can, can, none of can, those. Well, if I'm going to say for me personally, I don't really care about um, like what your film might have done at whatever festival. Or that. Oh, obviously, it's nice and it's good to have, and it does show that like, you know your your work is being appreciated to a certain extent. Like I'm not going to discredit it, but for me personally, I mean, yeah, there, there's so much there's so much more um, to 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 it for for me personally. It's kind of similar to what both Emery and Dan has touched upon um, earlier on. It's it's it's, it's more just like. For me personally, it's like, do I get anything from your from your work? Like, I I want to be able to feel engaged on it, even if it's something I know nothing about, or you know, I I may not in my spare time care to kind of know about. For example, if I'm able to click on your work and within that first five seconds, I'm kind of grabbed and intrigued to kind of know more or see more, or you know, there's I, I feel something from it in terms of like something emotive or just the energy or like. Yeah, for me, I feel like from, from when it's um, engaging and I'm not waiting 30, 40 seconds to kind of get into it, like, yeah, you've already got something good on your hands, to be honest. And it doesn't matter if, like, one person has seen it or five million people have seen it kind of thing. But obviously, it does help. It does help if you, if you have got, like, you know, nominated for something or awards and stuff like that. But it's not the end. It's not the be all. Brilliant. Um, we've got so many more questions, um, but I'm aware that we're already run slightly over. Um, so um, just in, in our last sort of minute or so, I just want to say, um, do any of you have um, any other sort of golden nuggets of advice that we haven't already touched on that you want to share, that you want to leave, leave the audience with? Anything else that we can sort of uh, serve to inspire? Andre, I know you're butt brimming with lots of <laughs> now, lots to be honest, of advice. Could, now, to be honest, I could talk for days. To be honest, but, I, but most of, most of the things everyone's kind of already said. But I, um, I do want to touch on what Emery said in terms of like you need to kind of have a passion for it because it is a lot of work. And as Emery said, it's that like, you know you might think you are working hard right now, but once you actually get across that line, oh my days! It's so it's, it's, it's there's so much more work into it. I mean, you, you'll go through an emotional, mental roller coaster in that sense as well. So that really be kind of dedicated to, to your craft in that sense, because there is a hundred thousand people doing the same thing you want to be doing in a sense. And you kind of, you, 
it's kind of like in, in in most kind of professions, you know, you you really got to work at it. You re- and 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 have a, a network of people as well. Yeah. Build your network. Build your like yeah. A lot of like people. Nobody makes it on their own. I was gonna say yeah. a lot of people that's in like dance position. They came up with a group of people that they're still probably working with to this day. Whether it's an editor, grader, um, you know, DOP. Uh, that's a uh, director of photography. For those that don't know, like it, it doesn't matter. Like try and build a team of people around you any anyone else yeah and just just touching on the 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 the, you know it's a numbers game getting getting jobs and a lot of the time it feels like you're hitting a brick wall and coming up against no after no after no but just remember that there is a way you there will be a break at some point you know um and there's always ups and downs with, with, with having busy busy periods and, and not so busy periods. And that is, that is important. And, and Emery said well before, you know, it's just about keeping yourself busy and keeping that creative process going, constantly writing ideas, making stuff, you know, referencing, creating mood boards, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And go, like, hopefully when things are a little bit more open again, when we're able to walk around freely, like one thing I, I did so much as a as a young person was just literally go see so many films and go to so many events and turn up to so many things that inspire you. You'll be surprised at how many people you will meet there as well, just in random conversations. It's certainly how I met some of the people that I'm working with now, it's literally being at a, an event like this uh, in person, obviously. But that's another great way in which to, 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 to meet people and, and potentially find an avenue and I think also about meeting like-minded people find your peoples basically that's really important really because it can be a very lonely place um, and you know that can as Dan said you will you will come up a lot against a lot more no's at first than yeses and even the biggest directors we have they lose jobs not like they're on a winning streak where they just get bounced from one job to another it, it, it's really tough so I think you've got to be able to have something else that you're into as well. I think have other things that you're interested in that you can lean into outside of those times. I also think be encouraged by the state of the industry at the moment with the pandemic and everything else. It's kind of made everyone take a step back and reconsider what's important and creativity has is kind of just starting to bubble again and people are looking for exciting new talent at the moment so like all production companies that's their focus new talent exciting voices that we haven't had before so it's a good time brilliant what a positive note to end on and i can see you're all finding your people in the chat box there it's very Uh (laughs) very very busy um well rose andre emery and dan thank you so much this has been really really fascinating and full of so much useful useful advice and and information and um thank you all for watching enjoy the rest of the film festival and i'm gonna hand back over to alex thank you so much rowan Thank you so much, our lovely panelists. Special shout out to Andre for helping out in the chat box as well. That was really, really helpful because <laughs> we could and it was so chaotic. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know before you leave um, that uh, we put together a little uh, festival survey, uh, which we'll post in the chat box shortly and which will also be emailed to you from Eventbrite. If you could take a couple of minutes to let us know what you thought of today's event, even though I can see from the chat box that you all loved it, uh, but it would be nice to have something official uh, from you. That would be great. We really do read um, all your feedback and um, it helps us improve our um, future Um, online events so that would be great if you could do that and next up is our Friday hotspot with Phil Clark over on the BFI YouTube channel Phil Clark is a comedy producer and a commissioner and his producing credits include Brass Eye, Peep Show, Fresh Meat, Chewing Gum and most recently I May Destroy You so a really really fun talk Phil will be talking about his career but also explaining what exactly it is that a producer does Um, so tune tune in 
the event is free, um, um, no registration is required, um, and Noor has just posted the links uh, in the chat box as well. So we have an accessible version with British Sign Language and subtitles and also a non-BSL version. So take your pick and see you That's at six o'clock, so in half an hour. Thank you so much, everyone, again, um, and see you tomorrow for day three of the BFI Future Film Festival. Bye.